In the search for transportation nowadays, two predominant demands prevail, speed and reduced cost. However, this panorama is not recent. In 1913, itineraries of Wabash and Union Pacific highlighted the fastest and shortest route between locations. The evolution seemed logical, but it didn't happen quite like that. Surprisingly, speed was once considered a negative aspect. The incessant increase in locomotion speed was, for some, a generator of stress and anxiety. Trains were then labeled as, too fast. To better understand, let's look at the beginning of this industry. In 1916, the US railway network reached a milestone of 408,000 kilometers. By 1920, trains achieved a superior level of quality, with extensive networks, speed, and comfort. It seemed to be the ideal mode of transportation, but someone made the citizens of that time believe otherwise. During a period when automobiles were gaining popularity, the automotive industry did not want to compete with railways. The criticism of the constant increase in train speed resurfaced, along with the proposal to slow down modern life and enjoy the freedom that cars provide, without depending on schedules. Having the freedom to be where and when you want was a unique privilege of personal transportation. With this proposition, car sales skyrocketed, diverting investments from railways to highways, irreversibly changing the face of trains since the 1920s. Curiously, even after a century, car ads still use the same arguments. In Brazil, the rise and fall of trains occurred later, but it happened. In 1960, the Brazilian railway network reached 38,000 kilometers. However, the global trend was pointing towards the development of integrated highways and railways, but the plans derailed. Over the years, smaller and deficit railways disappeared, leaving only those that run through the metropolitan regions of major cities. In this scenario, the Ferrovia do ACO, Steel Railway, stands out, promised to be completed in 1,000 days, but only inaugurated in 1989, with a delay of 4,140 days. The Brazilian railway network lost 8,000 kilometers, being replaced by roads and cars. The questions that remain are, how did the automotive industry sabotage trains? What other factors influenced the disappearance of trains in Brazil? And what does the future hold for us? The answer to these questions will be the theme of this video. Trains have high operational power being more efficient and competitive than road transportation for distances of 600 kilometers or more, especially for lower value-added products. There was a period when railway transportation dominated both the movement of goods and people. In the mid-19th century, before the popularization of cars, technological advancement progressively improved the railway system. Tracks were perfected, dangerous curves eliminated, and locomotives gained speed. Year after year, journeys became shorter, something unthinkable nowadays. In the USA, this progress of railway transportation led to numerous accidents. The cause, however, was not the infrastructure or the trains, but rather the time. At that time, time zones did not exist. Each city determined its time based on the position of the sun or stars. So, with the expansion of railway transportation and longer journeys, trains started sharing tracks. To avoid accidents, the engineers needed to know the passing time of other trains in the opposite direction, to divert and wait for their passage. But with time differences between cities, especially the most distant ones, the engineers were not certain of when they would cross paths with another train. This resulted in accidents causing fatalities and blocking the tracks. The situation was only resolved with the creation of a national standard time, dividing the USA into five time zones. Even then, there were complaints. 
everything seemed to flow smoothly until the situation stagnated and, in fact, regressed. The rise of automobiles was more devastating to trains than could be foreseen. Advocates of railway transportation initially did not take automobiles seriously. By the end of the 19th century, they were seen as nothing more than expensive toys. But the automotive industry established itself, occupied the space, and thrived. Much of this was due to a significant portion of the population benefiting from the success of automobiles to this day. This industry has a long production chain, with substantial impact on the economy, employing a skilled workforce. Not to mention the oil industry, driving this whole ecosystem, and road construction. Therefore, it was not difficult to sideline trains when they seemed to threaten the success of automobiles. The popularization of aviation also played a crucial role in the decline of railways, especially for long distances. Robert Servero, an emeritus professor at the University of Berkeley, in an interview with CNBC, spoke about how we live in a car culture. He said, it's hard to break that cycle, moreover, in our political system, we have very powerful lobbies from the oil industry, car manufacturers, the aviation sector, all those groups that high-speed trains would have to compete with. Companies like General Motors, a car and engine manufacturer, Firestone Tire, in the tire industry, and Standard Oil, in the oil industry, are examples of companies that joined forces to buy all streetcar systems, trams, and discard them. Since then, the government has been investing more and more in roads. Railways were practically forgotten, and the automotive industry won the battle without much effort. In 1916, when American roads reached their peak, the government funded several states to improve their highways. By the late 1920s, Americans traveled five times more by car than by train. The lack of individuality and extremely fast travel also worked against railways. American writers criticized the rush of trains and extolled the slowness of automobiles. Dallas Law Sharp spoke about how trains offered only blurred landscapes to passengers, while cars were more patriotic, encouraging people to enjoy the country. Ironically, years later, with innovations in vehicles and roads, cars gained more speed, and highways increased speed limits, turning the patriotic landscape into a blurred one again. Speed, criticized in ancient times, was well received in the automobile era, and the idea of getting rid of railways seems increasingly problematic in the long run. But what really happened to trains in Brazil? In Brazil, trains have a history that can be compared to that of the United States, however, it is full of specificities. In 1858, the beginning of operations was marked by the activity of the Recife and San Francisco Railway Company. Growth came at an accelerated pace, but some not-so-good investments were made, especially in rails that did not generate profits in market conditions. A decree in 1872, the 5.106, gave railway companies the option to choose the gauge. This decision has repercussions to this day, as a major problem for the Brazilian railway sector. Paulo Roberto Filomeno argues that the diversity of gauges hindered the development of railway transport from the beginning in Brazil. During this period, the global standard was to adopt uniform gauges, but Brazil ended up opting to buy railway material available abroad. However, the unsustainability of this model quickly came to light. With most equipment being imported, inflation and exchange depreciation severely affected the acquisition of new equipment. Salary increases and emerging competition with roads also played their role. However, the coffee crisis and the government of Juscelino Kubitschek were decisive in the degradation of the railways. In the 19th century, the expansion of railways was driven by coffee, a central product in the Brazilian economy. So, the 1929 crisis shook various sectors, including railways, due to the Great Depression and the fall of the New York Stock Exchange. 
the USA, the main buyer of Brazilian coffee, suffered immensely. Coffee exports and prices suffered a drastic decline. The privately managed railways under concession experienced a considerable drop in profitability with the reduction of cargo volume. This marked the first signs of the decline of railways, which would eventually be nationalized. From 1940, the Brazilian economy, previously focused on agriculture, shifted to industry. Many people migrated from rural areas to cities, contributing to the reduced demand for passenger trains in certain sections. The government realized that building roads was less costly than railways, and oil, used in fuel production, was cheap at the time. This scenario coincided with the Cold War, where the United States tried to approach Brazil to prevent a possible alliance with the Soviet Union. With this partnership, agreements were made, and from there emerged the executive group of the automotive industry in 1956, making Brazil an automobile manufacturer. More roads were built, more cars were manufactured, and the railway system needed reforms. In 1954, the Brazil-United States Joint Commission emerged, proposing a broad restructuring of the railway system and centralization of the administration of railway companies with the creation of the state-owned RFFSA. However, no proposals for integration or modernization of the lines were presented. Instead, the only suggestion was to shut down deficitary sections. Simultaneously, the political class prioritized the construction of roads, as per Decree 2.698 of 1955, which established a mechanism to eliminate railway lines and use tax revenues on fuels and lubricants to pave highways. With Juscelino Kubitschek in power in 1956, there was a new attempt to save railways with the Goals Plan, which prioritized road transport but promised to reorganize railways around commodity logistics for exportation. The focus on road transport made sense as it contributed more to the development of the National Industrial Park. This scenario persisted until the 1980s when public resources for the state-owned RFFSA and FEPASA were exhausted, and investments were only resumed after privatization. Ratan Neto, a professor of transport engineering, said in an interview with BBC Brazil that the idea of concession to the private sector was less about seeking efficiency and more about relieving the national treasury of the burden of railways. In the agreements, private companies were not required to invest, only to maintain operations, increase transportation production, and reduce accidents. The construction of new railways was left to the government, which gave little incentive for the expansion of the railway network. Meanwhile, road transport continued to be encouraged, accelerating the decline of trains. In 2018, the truckers' strike halted the country and reignited the debate about road dependence, showing the negative consequences of relying mainly on one transportation mode. The question that remains is, is anything being done to change this? There are remarkable differences in the structuring of countries that invested in railways and those that neglected them. China, for example, made significant investments and now has the fastest railway network in the world. In Europe, countries like France also boast high-quality and high-speed railway systems. It's surprising to imagine that railways, once leading in transportation efficiency, were replaced by less efficient forms that only achieved similar standards after many years of evolution. Today, railways, once seen as a transportation mode of the past, are emerging as an important element of the future. Recently, the New York Times reported a massive investment in the railway industry in the USA, the largest since 1971 integrating a project to inject $66 billion into this sector. In Brazil, the Ministry of Infrastructure predicts investments of around 180 billion reais in 2022, thanks to the new legal framework for railways. But will it be enough considering the changing times, evolving demands, and the growing problem of corruption? Currently, 
transportation needs are not the same as two decades ago. Although people value individuality and the freedom to choose their travel times, the speed factor has gained more relevance. Perspectives have changed. Congested traffic and wasted time have led people to rethink the notion that slow travel is relaxing. Queues and more queues of traffic are not relaxing. In this scenario, trains emerge as an excellent alternative to expedite travel and provide comfort. In the past, railways were seen as obstacles to the success of automobiles and people's tranquility. Today, they represent hope for a future with fewer hours wasted in traffic and more time for what really matters. They also promise more efficient freight transportation, with reduced freight costs and less wear and tear on roads caused by trucks. Now, what do you think about the end of trains and their possible future? Let me know in the comments and don't forget to see what other subscribers are saying. Now, to find out what happened with Ford, which went from almost bankruptcy in Brazil to a billion dollar profit after leaving the country, check out the video playing on your screen now, where I'll tell you this story. Click there, and we'll see each other in a few seconds. So, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.